Okay, good afternoon or good morning and welcome to our webinar titled Banks, Wallets and the Future of Payments. My name is Meli Sondermoval, publisher of the papers, and I'm delighted to be the host of today's webinar with our partner, Tunes. And thank you so much for joining. It's great to see so many of you tuning in today. So what's the story? Well, the pandemic has had a massive impact on the world of payments with people turning towards digital payment methods as a safer way to pay than cash, to pay for shopping, food delivery, and much more. Mobile wallets are among the key types of digital payments that saw a huge surge in adoption. And this unprecedented growth of global mobile wallets is expected to keep accelerating. So stay tuned. In today's webinar, we will address some basics on mobile wallets, the different types of mobile wallets and latest technologies and trends. We will talk about different use cases and benefits for both consumers and merchants. And we will address a really important topic about how to achieve interoperability between different mobile wallets and conventional payment methods and why Visa partner with Tunes to connect to 1.5 billion wallets into its ecosystem. And lastly, opportunities for banks and FIs. Before introducing the speakers, I would like to start with some quick notes regarding housekeeping. The discussion will take approximately 35 minutes and we will have 10 to 15 minutes for a Q&A at the end of the webinar. On the right side of your screen, you can see a chat panel, which includes a chat room and a Q&A widget. You can use that Q&A widget to ask questions at any time throughout the discussion. We will compile the questions and the speakers will address as many of us as we have time for during this webinar. In the handout section, you can find some interesting reports and materials for your reference. For instance, a report on the Gen Z and the future of spending and some background materials on the partnership between Visa and Tunes. So, Today, I'm joined by Jenna Weyer, SVP Americas at Tunes, and Vali Ardalan, Vice President of Visa Direct. So, uh, hi, Jenna. Hi, Vali. If you Hello. Good. Hi, hi, um, Vali. Um, how are you today? It's great to see you. Thank, thank you very great. much. Great to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, let's start with uh, Jenna. Jenna. Can you tell the audience a bit more about yourself and about your current role? Happy to. Um, I'm Jenna Weyer, based in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm the SVP GM of the Americas for Tunes. Um, I manage all of business development and um, account management, as well as sales in our region. I oversee the US, Canada, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Cool. Um, and Vali. How long have you been in fintech? And, and tell us a bit about your current role as well. Sure, I've been in fintech in uh, one form or another, probably over about the last 10 years. Uh, currently, I lead all the revenue and sales activities globally for Visa Direct and Visa. Um, Visa Direct is our move money network where we enable our clients to reach um, multiple different endpoints, whether it be accounts or cards or particular to this conversation today through our conversation with Tunes Digital Wallets. Um, really, we're looking to drive digital payment innovation and help to enable our clients to send money to uh, their clients in the best ways that they know how. Great. Well, it's an amazing role, um, Vali. So for the audience, do reach out to these two guys. They uh, have a lot of knowledge in this field and they would love to take your questions. So um, let's start with some scene setting and, and look into the usage of mobile wallets across regions. I mean, Asia is known for it. Uh, digital wallets account for 69% of overall e-commerce volume. And in India, this percentage is 45%. In Europe, it's less, it's 27%, but it's still a substantial number. And millennials and Gen Z tend to embrace digital wallets. So take this number into account since 48% of Zoomers or Gen Z, if you want, uh, abandon their shopping cart if their favorite payment method is not available. And um, this trend is going to continue. Digital wallets are experienced to exceed 5.2 billion globally by 2026. That number will continue to grow because consumers 
get more comfortable storing their financial information and handling payments through their, their smartphones. And I think it would be good to do a little bit of background on mobile wallets because there are still sometimes some, some mis misconceptions about what it really is. And um, Jenna, for those of us that have been living under the rock, maybe you can explore a little bit about more about what are mobile wallets, how do they work, and what are the different types of wallets and technologies out there? Yeah, happy to go through that. I mean, so ultimately a digital wallet is a virtual account, right? That allows users to store fiat or digital currencies and send virtual currencies maybe to one another. Um, in the emerging markets, especially digital wallets can be used for lots of different reasons, right? Within their day-to-day -day activity from paying utility bills to completing online transactions. Many of us, you know, in the US, for example, are very familiar with digital wallets because we may pay at checkout with them. Um, since these payment methods are digital, they do need to be loaded, right, with some kind of fiat or digital currency that can be transferred from either a bank account, a debit card, for example, or prepaid cards. Um, there's lots of different ways to, to load a digital wallet, but they are accessible via lots of different technologies as well, right? So you can access a digital wallet on your desktop if you're purchasing online. Um, obviously, mobile wallets in the emerging markets are actually mostly accessed via a mobile phone of some sort or maybe a, some kind of tablet. But uh, digital wallets definitely have evolved uh, over time. Uh, users can now store loyalty points in a wallet. They can have digital coupons. They can even store their identity in a digital wallet. Um, and some of us, many of us here may be using a digital wallet or even used a digital wallet if you went into an office and, and bought a Starbucks out of a digital wallet, for example. Um, but when it comes to digital wallets uh, globally, right, in the emerging markets, there are continued signs that the digital wallet ownership is obviously gaining traction. Um, especially in inbound remittance markets. So when you think about people who need to get money from their family all over the world, the largest inbound remittance markets are China, India, Mexico, the Philippines, Kenya, and Bangladesh, for example. So just to give you some insight into where in the world these inbound remittance uh, markets are. And then in terms of uh, answering your question around types of wallets, there are, you know, we, we basically see three kinds of wallets, right, that we're most familiar with. One is a closed loop wallet. Now, Amazon Pay is interesting on the slide here because they actually started as a closed loop where you could only use Amazon to purchase on Amazon, but they have even evolved, like I said, and you can now use Amazon Pay to purchase in lots of different places. They've basically uh, been likened to a PayPal at this point. Uh, but closed loop means you can store value in a wallet, but you usually can only use it within a particular store merchant uh, at a particular location or on a particular platform. So you're, you're not able to take that wallet and then go transact in a lot of different places. Um, second, second kind is a semi-closed um, loop wallet, which is can be used at a wider selection of places. And both of these wallets, both closed loop and semi-closed, are both loaded in similar ways, typically loaded by maybe a credit card or a debit card. Uh, semi-closed means you could use it at and ultimately a wider variety of places, mm -hmm. right? You can use it on an e-commerce store, you can lose it, use it in, in, in various places. And then open loop is almost like you can use it like a credit card. You can use it anywhere that, that ultimately will, um, you know, accept the various types of digital wallets. So th those are kind of like the three types that, that we typically see. Thank you. And um, Jenna, you talked about digital wallets, e-wallets, mobile wallets. Is that all somewhat like the same concept? Uh, they, they can be, but there is a, a bit of a variation, right? Um, in terms of how people use it. Uh, like I said, a digital wallet usually is an app form, right? Where you have it, you know, on your phone um, and they can be used in different ways in terms of how they connect to the technology accepting the form of payment, right? And many of us who maybe used a digital wallet, like a, maybe a Google Pay, because I'll, I'll say that because the logo is here, you can use that online, but then you can also actually use it at point of sale. So the, they're, they're used in those two different formats. Yeah, it's the same concept, but different sort of channels and formats. Clear. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we talked about, you know, the, the us using wallets and we would love to know from the audience. So maybe we can launch our first poll here. Have you ever used a digital wallet that is not PayPal, Apple Pay, Samsung or Google Pay? Is that yes, many times? 
yes once or twice or no. So let's uh, give the audience 10 seconds or so. What, what, what do you expect? It, I guess it very much depends on where the audience is coming from, but um, what do you expect? I mean, I'm thinking that lots of people have used wallets, uh, yeah. but I'm a, I'm a predominantly mobile user, so we'll see what the audience has to say. <laughs> Okay, so let's, um, so it's other than PayPal, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, and Google Pay. Let's launch, let's see what the audience. Uh, yeah. So it's interesting to see that um, basically a majority, 46% says no. So probably they use PayPal, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, and Google Pay, but not the other wallets. Mm -hmm. uh, 20, 20, yes, yeah, so. Well, it's an interesting, uh, interesting, it says something about the audience, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, let's go on. Um, let's move on um, and ask Vali, like, so there's quite a substantial part of this audience is not familiar with other types of wallets. Maybe you can elaborate a bit more on wallets, like what are the challenges they are solving and why consumers like mobile wallets? And also, what are the benefits for merchants? Sure. I mean, I think like it's it's hard to deny how fast we're seeing global wallets spread across the world and the use cases associated to them, right? You couple a rapidly digital digitalization of our kind of pay, payment ecosystem with mobile acceptance technology around the world, and they create a perfect storm, right? We talked about 5 billion digital wallet holders by 2026. That's up from a, just over 3 billion today. That's a huge number of growth that we're expecting to see in the next few years um, and already a huge number of users today. With that acceleration in, in digitalization, the world becomes increasingly smaller and more globalized in terms of accessibility. So more businesses have international suppliers to settle with, more businesses re rely on gig economy workers, freelancers or content creators that they need to pay. Um, businesses have ambitions to expand to multiple countries and um, address international customers, how do they pay them, how do they make sure that they're getting funds there fast and quickly, and also how do they integrate into the local payment ecosystems. Um, more and more people are moving between countries, and as migrants or travelers find new ways, they need to be able to, to access those funds as they arrive into new countries, and, um, and mobile wallets enable that to happen very quickly in many cases. I think really, like, if you look at the nature of technology today and the customer experiences that we have in our own lives, we are starting to get to a near real-time ex expectation for any of the transactions that we do. You know, And I often talk about how if payments are being done correctly, then payments should be invisible. So they're becoming more embedded in these super apps that we're seeing. And digital wallets are, are creating opportunities for instant or near instant cross-border transactions. Um, so it really makes a big difference in our day-to-day -day lives. It's it's enabling merchants to access customers and consumers that they weren't able to access through, um, you know, previous ways. And we're growing that that ecosystem together um, and how that wallet interacts with whether it be the employees or the, the shopper or the merchant itself. Um, obviously, there's multiple iterations of that. But, you know, I think what the team at Tunes have been doing is really putting that into play in, in some interesting ways. And I think, Jenna, you guys have a really great example of how you pulled this whole thing together with Grab, and I, and I love how that works on, on that app there. Yeah, happy to go into what we did for Grab. So so like Valley said, Tunes powers Grab. If, if no one's heard of Grab, if you've never traveled to Southeast Asia, South, uh, Grab is ultimately the, the Uber of Southeast Asia, right? Uber actually left that region of the world because Grab did so well. Mm -hmm. So Grab is both a um, kind of ride sharing platform as well as a, a food delivery, grocery delivery platform. So when you think about you know, people in the emerging markets, they're, you know, they can struggle financially where they're basically earning a paycheck, not week to week, but day to day. And so a grab driver, for example, can do some rides, you know, do some deliveries early in the morning, but then they may need to fill their motorbike with gas midday and or maybe they're going home and need to buy groceries for their family on their way home. And how do they do that? And how do they cash out of their earnings that they earned earlier in the day. And so Tunes is powering the experience in the Grab app where a driver can do those rides in the morning and ultimately tap the app 
and they have a few choices. They can cash out into the Grab Wallet, which functions much like, more like an open wallet in Southeast Asia. They can go and use that wallet in different places, pay for their gas at the gas station. Or let's say he, may, he maybe the driver just needs cash, right? They tap the app and they can uh, then go pick up money at an ATM and cash out within five minutes. So it's basically near real time. Um, and then we, we've given them the ability to then cash out in various ways. So that's a good example of how we're powering mobile wallets, but also kind of the interoperability of how they're getting money in different ways. Yeah, it's really interesting. I hear so it's very much a cross-border component yeah, for for merchants and for for consumers. There's this instant, um, and it's basically gives a lot of flexibility for payout, whether it's in cash or an all instant. And of course, for merchants, a way to expand into other regions. So let's talk a bit, bit more about these geographical concentrations. Are mobile wallets really about? You mentioned Grab as an example about emerging yeah. markets. I think, you know, if we look, depend, I, don't, I don't know what the audience space is here, but I think if, if you look at countries like the US, Canada and Europe, for example, right, very credit card centric countries. So if you go there, you can have a Visa card and really transact anywhere in those regions, right? But once you travel a little bit further across the planet into the emerging markets, you will notice that card is really not the predominant way to pay. Right. And that's why we say that the emerging markets is so highly concentrated in the mobile wallet space. Um, so really, when you go there, how do you transact then? Right. You need to download a mobile app, usually, which is this digital wallet that allows you to transact. So consumers can, you know, like I stated before, ultimately load or top up their wallet so that they can use it as if it were a credit card at, at whether it's, you know, a P2P transfer, they need to move money to their friends. You know, we're familiar with Venmo here in the, the US. So think of that internationally. How do they move money to other peers or family? Uh, but then they also need to, you know, buy food at the grocery store, pay with, at a street vendor, right? They have these variety of ways they need to pay for things. And they are doing this via a mobile wallet versus via just the typical credit card or debit card that we're used to. And a big reason for that, right, in the emerging markets is um, most of them are unbanked, right? So we're used to being able to go to a bank, get a credit card, get a debit card. In the emerging markets, that's not the case. There's a high percentage of them who don't actually have a bank account. So they're using their digital wallet as a version of a bank account. Yeah. And Jenna, are there, are there differences in terms of technologies that are used across these regions? I mean, does an Asian wallet look, sim look is similar, works familiar, uh, similarly or differently than, for instance, an, an Amer and Latin American one, the one in, in Brazil, for instance? Sure. So I, I'm going to share a bit, a bit of data around kind of country metrics, what we're seeing, and also a bit around uh, the types of wallets in the various countries. And, and these are just kind of like the biggest uh, countries of, of mobile wallet usage. So, you know, I'll talk about U.S. first because we're all familiar with wallets here, but nearly one third of the U.S. population, right, uses wallets. Um, we all are familiar with not only the digital experience, but also the NFC experience, right? You can take your phone and you can even pay with Venmo at you know, CVS these days. Um, so really the largest ones we see here in the US are Apple Pay, Starbucks, funny enough, is one of the biggest ones, Google Pay, and as you mentioned in the in the in the survey, Samsung Pay as well. Um, but Chinese uh, users also use wallets a lot. Nearly 70% of the Chinese population is using a wallet. And to answer your question around, you know, how are they using it? Are they different? In China, right, these wallets are typically via QR code. So you have a little code on your phone, they scan it, and that's how they pull the money out of your wallet. Uh, there are other, uh, there are some popular versions of wallet in China, which we're familiar with a lot of these. Uh, Alipay, WeChat Pay are the two largest players. And then in Japan, for example, Line Pay or PayPay or Rakuten Pay. Is, is also a familiar version that we probably all heard of as well. Um, India has a very large wallet population. Uh, they have their own kind of local wallets, but they also have a very large number of users in India using Amazon Pay, for example, which is some interesting data. Um, Brazil has a digital wallet with 60 million users. PicPay is actually the wallet they use in Brazil. Uh, and then we can think of other regions of the world, such as you know, Tigo Money is a popular wallet that is used by uh, I think over 5 million people. And this is spread out across Latin America. So Paraguay, 
uh, Bolivia, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, for example, cover that Tigo money network. And then the last kind of region I'll, I'll chat about real quickly is Africa, which is where we see a lot of mobile wallet usage. Yeah. Um, like I mentioned before, Africa has the world's largest unbanked population. So 57% if not more of the African population actually does not have a bank account. And so the leading mobile money service providers in Africa are uh, M-Pesa, Orange Money, MTN Money, uh, and Airtel Africa. So just to, for, for those who want to recognize what other mobile wallet names are, those are some from all over the world. And Jenna, are there any emerging trends that you're currently seeing globally, trends that basically play into this growth of, of mobile wallets? You know, I, I would say yes, we are, we're definitely seeing emerging trends, not only from a geographical perspective, but from a demographic perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So I've got older kids at home. Um, they use their, they use mo their mobile phone for everything, right? They're on that thing every day, uh, all, all day. So digitally native consumers are part of this like millennial Gen Z demographic, and they tend to embrace their mobile phone as well as wallets. Um, and are actually shifting away from traditional money, right? If I were to ask my daughter, who's 23, hey, do you have cash in your wallet? She, what cash, right? <laughs> it's like, I have a credit card and I have my Google Pay and, and that's what she's using to transact. Um, so the, these younger generations are definitely using their mobile wallets as ways to transact, not only because they're sending money to their friends, right? They go to the bar, they need to refund their friends for, for their tab. Um, and then ultimately this generation too, they just have different financial habits, right? They're probably not as much into budgeting and like a physical checkbook as, as the older generations may be. Um, their, their financial attitudes are a bit different, which is why I think the mobile wallet and ease of use, that instant kind of gratification of a mobile wallet is, is why they tend to lean toward that form of payment. 75% uh, of surveyed Gen Z uh, use P2P payment platforms every month right? So they're finding a way to move money to their friends or family at least once a month. Uh, and it was about 70% for Gen Z. So still a very high percentage of that demographic is using a mobile wallet, you know, relatively often. Um, also, you have to think about what they're buying and how they're buying, right? When you think about it, a lot of these um, kind of younger, younger generation, they're shopping via Instagram, they're shopping via ads on Facebook or just ads on their phone, right? Which means that it's pretty hard for them to pull out their, you know, credit card and type it in. So they're probably transacting via a mobile wallet that's already downloaded on their phone. Um, and obviously, like you mentioned before, COVID was, was a huge kind of shift in everyone moving to online and finding ways to not you know, go to a store or, or, or kind of shop outside of their house. So that also caused people to change their behavior. So if they weren't using wallets, they started to use wallets. Now, Vali, what excites you most in these in these trends? All of it. <laughs> it's moving. Uh, I think I'm, I mean, you know, we, we're very excited about how fast it's moving. It's giving billions of people more access to send and receive money around the world. Um, you know, just like Jenna said, you know, covid really accelerated the digitalization of payments. It, it forced a behavioral change across generations that maybe never would have adopted digital uh, engagement. And then I think, you know, reinforced and probably accelerated um, in the younger generations what was already happening there. Um, you know, I think, and I think about the, the interesting trends on this, I look at it in, in a couple of ways. One, it's all about UX. It's exactly what Jenna was saying, right? Um, consumers, yeah. uh, workers, individuals, content creators, nobody is accepting friction in the way that they're paying or that the way they want to be paid anymore. It needs to be seamless. It needs to be invisible. Um, you know, a good digital payment experience from a wallet often would include uh, or needs to include tokenization, contactless payments, fast funding capabilities, and the ability to send cross-border. And that's just a start. You know, you can tap that into something like WeChat Pay and have all of your chat messaging and everything else and all of your super apps that are now being built outside of these um, digital wallets is a part of them as well. And so super apps are the next thing that we're seeing that's growing um, in different parts of the world and servicing different needs. But, uh, but again, really embedding that use case into it. Um, cross-border. I mean, if we look at cross-border now, uh, I think cross-border transactions to mobile wallets grew by over 48% in 2021 to about, I think, a $16 billion um, value of, of transactions that happened in 21 to wallets. And that's still relatively small considering we think the whole wallet ecosystem is about a trillion dollar ecosystem. Um, so 
you know, really cool how you're now being able to send funds directly, transparently and cleanly in, in near real time, if not instantly to other wallet holders around the world. Um, and then finally, and really importantly, and, and in, this is a, to, to varying levels across different parts of the world, but, you know, access and financial inclusion, uh, you know, over a billion people, over more than a billion people have a mobile phone and have a bank account today. Um, you know, being able to connect those people to digital economies, to being able to give them access to uh, other parts of our financial ecosystems that we have around the world is just a critical part of what this whole um, this whole part of our payment ecosystem is evolving to service. So um, I think all of it's super exciting. It's it's exactly where um, we're very excited to be a part of. And yeah, just a great a great part of this the payment world today. Yeah, no, it, it is. But I. You mentioned sort of the, you know, moving money from one wallet to the uh, to another wallet. I mean, interoperability is still sort of a challenge, which is associated with mobile wallets. And 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 Jenna, how can that interoperability between mobile wallets and conventional payment methods be achieved? So as we were talking about, you know, the emerging the, the emerging market infrastructure is can be very challenging, right? And especially because that's predominantly where we're seeing you know, the large, large percentages of growth of wallet usage is it's pretty difficult and challenging, right, to, to number one, integrate to a local wallet, right? These are um, uh, pretty sometimes small companies that, you know, don't and they also don't have access to reliable infrastructure, Right. When you think about India on any given day, they could lose electricity. We're, we're not used to that in <laughs> in the U.S. or Europe. Right. We're like we're used to having electricity and Wi-Fi all the time. But in emerging markets, they, they have this not only technology, technological infrastructure challenge, but also because there are so many wallets. Right. How do you connect to all of them? And so it uh, can be very challenging to integrate to the wallet also maintain the wallet. And then you have to have kind of local expertise around consumers, how they're using it. But uh, one of the most challenging pieces is also, are you compliant? Like what is the regulatory landscape within that country? Uh, what what kind of compliance things do you need to worry about as, as a, a partner in the region, as well as, you know, what are the regulatory things tied to the wallet users, right? How are their transactions being monitored, et cetera? So those are all concepts that make it very challenging to, to build out a mobile wallet infrastructure in the emerging markets, but also to then, how do you create interoperability between all of these wallets and my, my simple answer, and I hate to sound too simplistic, is to achieve this takes time. And that's something that Tunes has done, honestly, over a decade. Is it, it took us over 10 years to build out this very robust kind of global network of wallets. Um, and we had to go country to country, wallet to wallet, right? So there's no shortcut to doing this. You actually have to go in region, which means you have to have local feet on the street, local experts who understand the technology landscape as well mm -hmm. as the regulatory landscape. Um, you know, we here at Tunes and across our entire network have built, I would say, thousands and thousands of routes of how the, the wallets can connect to each other. Um, and again, that was done. It took a lot of time and kind of local expertise to do that. But obviously, when you connect those, those wallets, you then find more ways and uh, obviously connect more people into this full global ecosystem. And how does that play into Tunes strategy? How do, that, do mobile wallets fit in, in, in a strategy of Tunes? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's the, it's one of the core strengths of our platform, right? We power lots of different ways to pay outside of just wallets. Uh, we can do bank accounts and cash pickup locations, for example, through our network. But really, the core strength of what sets us apart from a lot of our competitors is the strength and variety of, of the wallets and regions we can power wallets in. So more, more than 80% of our wallets, too, are done through direct integrations, um, so which means we control the last mile, we can control the quality of service. Um, there are some other providers that may claim they can do wallets, but often they're doing it through third party. So that's a, a, a big differentiator of Tunes versus some other platforms. Um, but to, to show how important this wallet strategy is for us and the masses, we're trying to reach really um, expansive uh, 
places, right? Where can we go to build a wallet that just has lots and lots of users to facilitate what we're doing and give them interoperability outside of just their wallet ecosystem? So a recent bit of news that we launched a, a little over a week ago, we, we've actually integrated direct to Tencent, which owns WeChat Pay in China, which has is giving us access to 1.3 billion users. Uh, which is pretty massive, of course. But in 2023, I would say we are focusing on deepening our network across the globe, right? So we will be expanding into more, um, you know, wallets, payment methods in the US, Europe, uh, but also continuing our, our expansion into Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Latin America. So it's really to have that global footprint in, in, in wallet, wallet connections. Okay. Cool. Um, Vali, Visa recently announced a partnership with Tunes to enable Visa direct transfers to 1.5 billion mobile wallet accounts. Why is Visa so excited about this segment? I mean, I think Jenna just answered most of the question right there with her, with, with, uh, her description of what Tunes does. Um, you know, the reality of it is, is people now just have a much greater choice and flexibility in how they want to send and receive payments, you know, and to my earlier comments about it's not really about wanting to focus those down specific channels. It's about being able to offer that optionality, but also being able to um, ensure that you have access to all the right endpoints around the world. Our core proposition with Visa Direct is really to help facilitate that money movement from an any to any kind of transaction. So how do we think about this, whether it be domestic or cross border, do we send funds to the, uh, to the card credentials that Visa has built over the last 65 years or to our account network? Um, and soon through tunes to our uh, to our wallet endpoint. Visa Direct today is uh, enables us to send or in our clients to send um, money to about five billion endpoints across the globe. Um, and you know we think the digital wallets in themselves will, as we talked about before, by 2026 be about 5.2 billion as a market itself. So you can kind of get the size of the digital wallet growth that we're expecting to see and. Um, we do think that as consumers get more and more comfortable storing their financial information and managing their payments through their smartphones, we're going to continue to see that number grow. So, you know, by partnering with Tunes, we're really extending our network to now offer our financial institution, our non-financial institution clients, the optionality to, to extend reach to an additional one and a half billion endpoints around the world today for their consumers and business customers. Um, I think what's really, really important here is is that by connecting um, with Visa Direct, clients are able to offer, our clients are able to offer kind of cutting edge payment options, uh, regardless of how you're going to send that, whether it be to a bank account, to a card, or uh, soon to be to a digital wallet, whether it be P2P or B2B and everything in between. Um, you know, we really uh, see a huge opportunity for new revenue opportunities for our clients and, and um, access to new customer groups. Um, and most importantly, really to deliver a holistic and better payment experience um, across all of those endpoints. So, you know, I, I think I could probably go on about it for the rest of the time we have. Uh, it's, a, it's extremely exciting for us and we're delighted to be working with Tunes. Yeah. Can you elaborate a bit more on the opportunities for banks? Because you mentioned revenue opportunities, uh, yeah, broader access to, to consumers, to smaller businesses. What, why should they care? Sure. I mean, I think I think it's becoming impossible not to care. You know, it's a it's a very important segment, but it's also giving access to banks and to their corporate clients and to themselves uh, to uh, new individuals and consumers that have not been they've not been able to reach. Um, as Jenna mentioned, in some regions, wallets might be one of the few financial instru instruments for those customers, yep. um, enabling cross border flows to these wallets for customers that participate in digital payment ecosystems. Um, you know, I think we think about financial inclusion. If you look in M-Pesa in Africa and how that's helping to give access uh, to the uh, payment ecosystems there like never before, um, you know, around a, at 1.8 billion, I think just under 2 billion people today are still uh, poorly served or left out by the global financial system. So really to access the unbanked or underbanked wallets are giving a huge traction point as a, like a first point of entry into that financial system. Um, I think through the partnership with Tunes uh, and Visa, banks are now able to kind of access um, near real-time flows and open these up to previously unreachable endpoints around the world uh, and activate, you know, like we talked about before, about one and a half billion wallet holders and 
44 odd countries. I think we're talking about connecting to over 70 wallets through Tunes and, and their connectivity and rolling that out over the next um, you know, 12 to 24 months. Um, Interestingly, and why we think this is a really compelling proposition that we've that we have we have here together with uh, Tunes is that you can do this through a single implementation, through a the same interface with Visa Direct, providing access to cards and accounts, um, and really helping to simplify both the front and back end part for our banks and partners around the world. Um, you know, it requires some but minimal system build and operational changes, and you know, comes with it that Visa grade. Um, scalability compliance and regulatory um quality that you'd expect from from visa to do today so i think it's a really huge opportunity for us to enable banks to offer and um provide new channels for their clients to send and receive money to wallets um and really just help to deliver huge and, and new convenience to their customers um you know consumers want to be paid how they want to be paid uh, and mm -hmm. businesses are starting to want to pay the way they want to pay and those two things don't always meet and there has to be something in between to kind of get any to any. Um, and I think banks still have a huge part to play. Um, and I think that these are just adding new opportunities for those banks to go and, and acquire new business. Yeah. And as you mentioned, with limited resources needed, because basically the infrastructure is is there to, to tap into. I mean. Yeah. I mean, you, you hear Jenna talk about 10 years to build out that network. Right. So. Um, I certainly hope it won't take 10 years to connect the Visa Direct if, if you'd like to access it through us. <laughs> no, it won't. Uh, Jenna, what can we expect from Tunes in, in the future? How are sort of your mobile wallet capabilities are going to evolve? What's next? You're muted, Jenna. Hmm. There we go. Um, like I said before, in 2023, we are we are focusing on deepening our network globally and, and happy to share maybe a little bit more detail around where we're expanding the network. Um, you know, we we will expand into U.S., Europe, countries in Africa, uh, the Middle East, Asia, Latin America and some interesting new countries for us. Uh, we added this year include Chad, Pakistan, uh, Nepal, Burkina Faso, Ivory Coast, Malaysia, and Vietnam, just to give you some variety of some of the things we've done this year. But then in 2023, we will add more coverage in areas such as Swaziland, Lesotho, Bangladesh, uh, India, Brazil, LATAM, and Mozambique. So it kind of shows, again, kind of where our, our focus is still in the emerging markets. Um, but we ultimately want to evolve the segments we serve, right? More use cases. So we can, we can uh, obviously P2P through remittance has been kind of our core uh, platform we built our, our technology on initially, but we're doing more in B2C, more to B2B. So we just want to find more ways and more use cases to help move money cross-border. Uh, and then finally, I think we're planning to add some additional solutions, uh, basically compliance as a service. So we will have software you can ultimately get through Tunes um, and additional AML capabilities uh, that can help you as a platform more securely and safely process payments across the globe. Great, many things. And let me briefly uh, wrap up before we start with the questions. And we have a lot of questions from the audience Please feel free to send in more and we will get to as many as we have time for. So basically, this partnership between Visa and Tunes helps consumers and small businesses move money internationally. And it's opening up a potential for greater financial inclusion. There's basically a simple integration with Visa Direct. So financial institutions, governments, NEO banks and money transfer operations will be able to utilize this new functionality and enable consumers and small businesses to send funds and receive funds across Africa, Latin America. Um, so great. So as I mentioned, before we start with the Q&A, we have two questions for the audience. The first question, and here we can maybe launch the poll, is how likely is it for mobile wallets to become part of your strategy? So let's see, Vali, how the uh, what, what the audience is, uh, how con convincing it was for the audience to make this really part of, of the strategy moving on with this 
massive acceleration of, uh, of growth. Let's look into the results of this first poll. Highly likely, 67%. <laughs> likely, 20, neutral, 7. Well, I think that only makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> any, any thoughts from you guys? I think it, it reflects exactly what we're seeing. You know, 87% likely or highly likely to uh, to have wallets as a part of their strategy. I think, you know, it's becoming harder and harder to it not be a part of your strategy. Um, and so no surprises there for me. Yeah, agreed. I think, um, you know, we see interest from so many different kinds of platforms that are looking at cross-border in different ways. And uh, really, it's consumers who are driving a lot of this. So they're going to their platforms they use or the banks they use saying, hey, we need this feature. So agreed. I, I think this just isn't in line with the, with the trends we're seeing. Cool. Then one last question before we really go to the, uh, the, the, the Q&A session. When, if yes, would you like to be contacted by Tunes and Visa to discuss collaboration opportunities is that as soon as possible, in a week, in a month or later? Okay, let's start with the questions. Uh, there's some great questions here. Um, the first one re regards CBDC. So how do you think CBDC impacts the wallet penetration and markets and services managed with central centralized digital currency? Um, would you like to take this one, Jenna? Yeah, happy to. We, we've had some interest from some of these um, centralized digital wallets ultimately, right, that have uh, said, hey, like, how do we get integrated into other versions of wallets? So this is, is it's a bit of a feature, right? Um, it's it's kind of a future state feature that that Tunes has thought about. Now, do we ever integrate it? It depends on market need, et cetera. What do we see from businesses and platforms that want to and need to facilitate this based on regions, right? Because there are certain parts of the world where CBDC is, is kind of the way a particular country is moving. Um, I still think it's a little early, though, so I don't have a ton or a lot of feedback on it just because we, we haven't had a ton of experience in it. But we're starting to hear um, at least some pings from from platforms and organizations that are interested in, in at least researching this particular idea. OK, thanks, uh, Jenna. Um, next question. Do you know of any model where cross cross wallet transactions are possible? And is this on a national and or an international level? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. Um, I mean, a good example of maybe a cross wallet transaction is, is we actually power the ability for M-Pesa and PayPal to work together. Mm -hmm. So anyone who is in Af Africa needs to use the M-Pesa wallet. Let's say they need to go pay a vendor or transact outside of the M-Pesa ecosystem, they can basically move money in between the M-Pesa and PayPal wallet to then transact via PayPal because PayPal is probably accepted in more places, right? And so that's probably the best example I have of how Tunes is powering the kind of inter-wallet or cross-wallet integration. Yeah, and what about domestic mobile and QR wallets in APEC? These are very successful and have created somehow a payment ecosystem on their own. Are these connected as well with Visa Direct or Tunes? We, we did provide a handout of our network. So feel free to take a look at all the different countries we power, all the different payment methods, and obviously very specific to wallets. You can see which countries we have wallet coverage in, as well as the wallet we actually support. So that, that network shape is, would be super helpful to whoever asked this question. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, the question around APAC and, and these kind of more domestic wallets, I think our, our, our news about WeChat is a great example of, is there a need, right, for mm -hmm. more than just a domestic wallet? And how are these maybe APAC Asia-focused wallets working with the rest of the world? Um, WeChat users need to find ways to transact in, in different ways with different people who are, have different wallets, which is the entire reason for this integration. So I think that's the perfect example of, yes, huge wallet provider in China, the biggest, but they were interested in, in working with Tunes because they, they have a variety of use cases in which right now the closed ecosystem of that WeChat wallet is not sufficient. They need to somehow get money into other places in other countries. Clear. 
Um, then you, you talked about, you know, the concept of a wallet that can basically be topped up by different payment instruments, be it cards or bank accounts. So what are the most common ways to top up a wallet? What payment instruments are mostly used? That's the first part of the question. And the second part is for those that are unbanked, that don't have basically a bank account, how can they top up the, the wallets? Can you um, sure. I mean, you know, in these kind of high inbound remittance countries, right, uh, many times people are being supported by family outside of the country, right, where uh, sure they may work, work a job in that country, but they do have money coming from family. So that is a very common way they're actually topping up their wallet is through that remittance flow. They're getting money from another country into their wallet. Um, so that that is a, a pretty popular way for them to be topping up those wallets. Uh, and I would say in other kind of parts of the world where maybe there's more access to banks or, uh, you know, other kind of fintech solutions. Mm -hmm. They're topping it up with a bank account, which is, is usually the most common way to kind of back up or load their wallet. Uh, and then also, you know, the typical Visa MasterCard um, are, are ways that they're topping up their wallet. Okay. Um, other question. Um, there is a lot of excitement about the interoperability mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, of different wallets and schemes. And there are some different initiatives in Europe as well, like EMPSA and EPI, you might be familiar with. How do you tune into these initiatives as well? I don't have an immediate answer for that, but happy to answer it later. Uh, I may have to get together some, some brains on my side to, to best answer that question. Yeah. I think they're, they're still pretty nascent. I'm not sure whether there is actually a working role up there, but it's, I, I guess, yeah, if you could look into this and um, address that later. Um, a more generic question. What are the top five advantages of wallets? Obvious convenience, I think, as, as, I, as I think both Valley and I mentioned in many of our responses was the ease of use of a wallet. Uh, also security. I think something people don't think about is in the digital wall experience, the transactions ultimately tokenized. So for those that aren't are kind of new to payments, tokenization means you're not actually passing that unmasked, what I would call credit card data, like we pass credit card data via web form. You're passing a token, which is really unrecognizable. So it's a more you know secure way to pass uh, information. So it's a more secure way to transact. Um, it does allow you to be a bit more organized, right? If you're storing your ID, if you're storing um, something I love about my digital wallet selfishly is that it stores my receipts. I'm horrible at keeping receipts. So if I transact, I can go back and go, okay, what did I spend at Home Depot? And I know because I can see it in my, in my, actual, in my digital wallet, even if I lost my physical receipts. So being more organized is probably kind of a third strength or, or, or um, reason why you want to use a wallet. Uh, I would say the fourth one is the, the concept of contactless payments, right? Um, whether you have like a wearable device, you can just put it up to the point of sale. You can, um, you know, just pull your phone out. You don't have to like sift through your wallet to get a card. It's just like that easy way to pay at point of sale and obviously just faster checkout, right? Uh, and then I think the last one would be uh, getting rewarded for your purchases, right? I think for me, honestly, I probably would never use my Starbucks app unless I knew I was going to get free coffee, <laughs> right? So um, that's a great example, I think, of where people are forced to pay via wallet because they know they get a reward at the end. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Look, I mean, speed, simplicity, access, transparency, and then I think like all the embedded value adds that you get, like by having that access, having it tied to all the different things you do, just like Jenna's saying, it gets, we can get really creative in how you know, you start seeing value-added services coming on how it makes other parts of your life more simple and accessible. Um, so, I, you know, I think those are those are the key ones for us, you know. Clear. Hey, Avani, I have a question for you here. Uh, how does this partnership work for the, for the Visa ecosystem? Sure. So, I guess technically, uh, well, I don't guess, technically existing Visa Direct clients will be able to expand their cross-border offerings that they have with us today with wallets without needing to um, use another service provider, which helps them on saving costs, which helps on the development resources. Um, the banks that connect with us once, they want to connect with us once and Visa is able to provide all those different layers of connectivity, whether that be FX, settlement, customer support, et cetera, um, that comes with the money movement that, that goes around 
whether you'd be sending it to account or to a wallet. Um, the benefits are extended across this ecosystem for PSPs, payment, payment gateways, merchants, uh, connecting through any one of these providers to expand their reach instantly and deliver a holistic cross-border solution. So if you take, for example, the creator economy, which is obviously, as we all know, very fast growing, um, it's made up of sellers, developers, social and gaming content creators, et cetera. So if you're a social platform looking to help generate co uh, commerce online, an enabler platform that helps creators get paid, or a gaming platform launching in-game purchases, or a fintech that supports all of these different things, um, the transactions are typically low ticket, need global distribution, have to be done with immediacy, um, and wallets enable us to provide that through um, through the Visa Direct ecosystem that we've built um, and, and with our other um, endpoints included. And we, we looked at it and said something just in this particular use case, like 93% of the um, content creators that were surveyed would switch platforms to access real-time payouts. And 88% of them um, yeah. would post more content on a platform that they knew they were getting real-time payouts. It's, it just ties back to that grab example that Jenna gave. It's something that we call earned wage access as well. It's like being able to get access to what you've earned instantly um, or near instantly. Um, and this is where I think you know, providing an ecosystem with send to wallet capabilities alongside of our card and account, it really fits in very nicely into the ecosystem that we're building from a money movement perspective. And is this already live, Vali? So we're live today with card and with um, account, obviously on on, uh, mm -hmm. on Visa Direct. We processed over 5 billion transactions uh, last year. Um, we are in the process of implementing tunes and we're looking to see that um, live and available for our clients in um, the very near future. So I think you know, within the next um, several months, we should be able to to make this available. And uh, we're certainly open for conversations about how it can plug into and fit into the use cases that uh, you know anyone's listening to today. Yeah. And, and do you see competition from from crypto specific wallets, um, MetaMask, Coinbase wallets, for instance? And what is the outlook on market competition? Is, is it possible for these crypto specific wallets to take over traditional wallets? So I'll let Jenna, I, I, I might defer to Jenna on some of this. I mean, at, at Visa, with Visa Direct, we really focus on um, fiat in and fiat out. So kind of mm -hmm. ramp, ramp in, ramp out. Um, and, you know, we, we continue to see how um, how we can service these platforms with, with providing fiat in and fiat out of them. But um, in the context of the overall wallet penetration, I'll, I'll defer to Jenna, who might have a better insight than me. Sure. I mean, honestly, we are not. Uh, we are not seeing uh, like an uptick of, of other platforms saying, hey, we're choosing a, a crypto wallet vendor versus Tunes. And I think a big piece of this, right, is still crypto is not uh, a widely adopted form of payment across the world, right? People don't, un crypto can be complicated to understand, even, you know, especially in the emerging markets where uh, they may not have as much education around crypto, how it works. Mm -hmm. And then also the availability of paying for crypto or accepting crypto is not widely adopted. So uh, I would say we we follow the trends, we kind of keep in touch with what's going on, but we've not seen any competition in the field. And I still think from a consumer perspective, it's still not a widely adopted form of form of payment. Okay, thank you, Jenna. Uh, there's a question about the life cycle of mobile wallets. Do wallet users switch to a bank account at some point? Or if, if it's when you use a wallet, you, you stick to that payment methods. Is there any, any insights into this? Yeah, I would say in the emerging markets, no, because many of them don't have access to a bank, right? So that, that's kind of what uh, the problem that has been solved is, is the fact they don't have access to a bank. Um, so I would say in those unbanked countries, it's not even an option, right, for them to move to a bank account. Um, for those, you know, maybe if I were to change the demographic, right, mm -hmm. story around maybe U.S. and Europe and that that Gen Z millennials using mm -hmm. using wallets, uh, time will tell. <laughs> as they get older, do they do they move to cash? Do they move to uh, you know cards? As they have to budget and have a mortgage to pay, maybe maybe they do start to transact and move into more traditional ways to pay. But I think for a while, uh, and especially because the digitization of, of commerce is increasing, they may never go back to those traditional ways, right? I, I even got an option the other day for my mortgage company of like digital ways they will accept my mortgage payment, which mortgage is like the oldest kind of infrastructure we can think of of payments. So that just shows that how more traditional 
even you know, merchants or companies that have to accept payment are actually moving into the digital space. So I don't necessarily think that people will move backwards in the future. Okay, well, indeed, time will tell. Yes. <laughs> um, what, interna what international regulators are participating in ensuring uh, compliance and transparency for wallet-to-wallet -wallet transactions? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. So we, we are, we at Tunes, we're licensed in different countries. So very often uh, companies can ultimately kind of piggyback the, the Tunes license to process across the globe. Um, but we, we, like I said, we have feet in the street, local compliance people really in, in almost, you know, every region that help us keep up to date with what needs to be done from a regulatory perspective. So it's true. It's complicated as you go country to country, but we are, um, you know, either we are licensed in those areas of the world and or uh, we often have the partners we're using are licensed. So that's how we, we, we maintain our compliance. OK, clear. There's time for one more question. Um, and I'll take the FX one. How is FX managed when funds are sent via Visa Direct across borders and how many currencies are supported? It's a good question. So, um Today on Visa Direct, we support, um, well, we deliver uh, currencies, 160 different currencies around the world today. Uh, you know, in terms of our uh, overall funds, we have settlement capabilities um, on our account uh, in over 60 currencies. Um, and we process our FX in a number of ways to ensure that we're offering um, flexibility for our customers. It's an increasingly important part. It's a, it's a, a key part of the wallet transaction is transparency um, mm -hmm. and cost effectiveness. So uh, I think the answer is, is that it varies by majors, minors, and exotics and, and by the endpoints that we associate them to. Um, but FX is, is a key part of any cross-border transaction today and um, providing optionality, providing an ability to uh, do it in real time is a, a key path for all of us. Okay, maybe one more question. Yeah, I see. I see two minutes. So maybe it's just a yes or no question for for Vali. Is the Visa Direct reach to Tunes wallets done through a single integration? Yeah. Cool. Then we have that out of the way. Okay. <laughs> Here, many thanks, Vali and and Jenna for for your insights for all the um, yeah this taking all the questions and engaging with the audience. And also thank you for all of you that joined us today and that were tuning in. What we will do, we will send all of you a link to the webcast shortly and we will get back to questions, or not we, it's actually Vali and Jenna, uh, who will get back to questions that we did not have time to include. So for now, thank you so much both for the speakers and for the audience and I hope to see you another time. Have a lovely rest of the day and a good evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.